questions. Thank you. That concludes general questions. We now turn to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you. To congratulate the presiding officer on his recent membership of Her Majesty's Privy Council and to ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, engagement is to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Presiding officer, it is clear that the Scottish NHS is in crisis. Audit Scotland has said, and I quote, there is no evidence of a clear long-term plan from Government to put the NHS in order. The First Minister has been in charge of this for nearly 10 years. Can she really claim today to have one? First Minister. Well, over the last decade, there have been improvements in the way health services are delivered and reductions in the time that patients need to wait for hospital treatment. There have also been improvements in overall health, life expectancy, patient safety and survival rates for a number of conditions such as heart disease. Presiding officer, these are not my words, that is the first paragraph of the Audit Scotland report published today. So context, presiding officer, context is important. But notwithstanding all of that, the NHS does face challenges. It faces rising demand, principally from an ageing population. Uh, these challenges are in no way unique to Scotland. They are common to health systems around the world. A point made by the Auditor General on radio this morning when she also said that Scotland's performance stands up well against that and the rest of the UK. And it's in light of these challenges, it's in light of that rising demand that we are ensuring record levels of funding and will increase funding by more than inflation over this parliament. It's why we've ensured to quote Audit Scotland, staff levels are at the highest level ever. It's why we're also uh, ensuring reform of the health service, not just investment in it, integration of health and social care, shifting resources into social care and primary care and expanding elective capacity for routine operation. So there's nothing unique about the challenges facing the health service in Scotland, but this government is focused on meeting these challenges and we will continue to be so. Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, the First Minister is the only person in Scotland reading today's papers thinking her government deserves a pat on the back for their performance in health care. And the reason that I asked the specific question that I did, which she ducked, is because the Audit Scotland report that I quoted wasn't from today. It was the one that came out in 2007 when this SNP government first came to power. And nearly 10 years on, Audit Scotland reports again with the exact same warnings as it was giving nearly 10 years ago about the lack of a clear plan, about the failure of this government to get a grip, and that has inevitable costs, waiting time targets that have been missed, doctors and nurses under ever greater pressure and health boards that are on the brink. The Royal College of Nursing asks today how many reports will be published by Audit Scotland before action is taken? And that's a fair question, First Minister. So what's the answer? First Minister. Well, I'm very happy. I'm very happy to compare the situation in the health service today to the situation in the health service in 2007 when this government took office. Uh, there is now more than £3 billion extra investment in the health service compared to uh, the time when we took office. There are 11,000 more uh, medical professionals uh, and nurses and other healthcare professionals working in our health service. That's why Audit Scotland today says that staffing levels in our health service are at an all-time high. And in terms of waiting times, of course there are challenges around waiting times in our health service, but let's look at the position when we took office. Back then, uh, just 85% of inpatients were seen within 18 weeks. Today, more than 90% of inpatients are seen within in 12 weeks. The NHS is performing better against a tougher target. Let's look at outpatients. When we took office, 70% of outpatients were seen within 12 weeks. Today, more than 85% of patients are seen within 12 weeks. And our accident and emergency departments, uh, the performance of our accident and emergency departments are eight percentage points higher than the accident and emergency departments in England, where the Tories are in government. So yes, there are challenges in our health service. That's why we have our vision 2020 strategy. It's why we have in place our new clinical strategy. It's why we're planning increased investment in the health service. It's why we're determined to shift the balance of care into community 
social and primary care. It's why we'll continue to focus on making sure that we improve the health service so it continues to have what it has today, at high patient satisfaction levels. Ruth Davison. So to my first question, no answer to the charges levelled by Audit Scotland. And to my second question, no answer to the charges levelled by the RCN and by Scotland's nurses. I think we need to spell out things today for what they are, and that is the failure of this government to get to grips with our NHS, and it is an outrage. Health boards are having to make huge savings in order to break even, to take out loans, to keep going, and to put off essential repairs to hospital buildings. And yet that we learn today, because of this government's failure to manage staffing, there has been a 47% increase in agency nursing and midwifering staff. And staggeringly, the individual agency doctors are being paid over £400,000 each to provide cover for periods of less than a year. And all of that while patient care suffers from cuts and hospital buildings are left to crumble. I call it a scandal. What does the First Minister call it? First Minister. Health service funding is higher than when we took office. The number of people working in our health service is higher than we took office. And waiting times are lower than when we took office. But the hypocrisy of Ruth Davidson is absolutely staggering. She talks about the financial performance of health boards in Scotland, and of course that is challenging. But health boards in Scotland met all of their financial targets as narrated by Audit Scotland today. In the same year that Audit Scotland is looking for, at the NHS in England, it had a two and a half billion pounds deficit, three times the deficit had in the previous year. Agency, agency spend. Uh, agency spend for nurses is 0.4% of the total budget. Agency spend per head of population is less than a third of what it is in England where the Tories run the health service. The point I'm making here, presiding officer, is this one. Our NHS faces challenges. But these challenges are not unique to Scotland. They are challenges faced by health systems across the world. But as the Auditor General herself said this morning, when it comes to facing up to these challenges, Scotland is performing well compared to other parts of the UK, and we will continue to focus on making sure we do so. Ruth Davidson. Presenting officer, the point is this, that while there have been some improvements in some areas over the last 10 years, which is welcome as far as it goes. Welcome as far as it goes. But the big question on the reforms to give our NHS a sustainable future to allow health boards to budget for the long term, successive SNP health ministers, including this first minister when she was in the role, have ducked the big challenges. And when the SNP came to power, we had the opportunity to avoid this. But now we have an unavoidable crisis on our hands because this government has preferred sticking plaster solutions and a strategy of no clear framework, no milestones and no costings, as we've heard today. Audit Scotland and the Royal College of Nursing are recommending today that health boards are given more flexibility to plan by having three-year rolling budgets rather than annual financial targets. We'll back that, will she? First well, I think that last question was a, a case of not waving but drowning, <laughs> grudgingly, <laughs> grudgingly accepting that there have been some improvements. There have been lots of improvements in the NHS in Scotland, unlike the situation, unlike the situation in England, where her party is in charge and we'll continue to focus on that. Uh, that's why we have integrated health and social care. It's why we have in place a new national clinical strategy. It's why we have a range of work to improve population uh, health. Uh, all of that adding up to delivering our 2020 strategy uh, and our broader strategy to 2030. And of course, Ruth Davidson should know that there is work underway to combine all of that work into a single delivery framework, which will be published before the end of this year. So I do not deny the challenges in our health service. There are challenges faced by health services right across the world. But the performance of our health service is a good one. Those working in it deserve our thanks. And this government will continue to work hard to make sure we are supporting them. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister when she will next meet ScotRail. 
First Minister. Scottish Government Ministers meet regularly with ScotRail. The Transport Minister did so uh, most recently last week. Kezia Dugdale. Officer, we discovered today that ScotRail isn't the only thing going off the rails under this government. The independent experts that Audit Scotland gave our NHS under the SNP a check-up. And the results of a decade of SNP control produced a grim diagnosis. Funding is not keeping pace with increasing demand and patient need. Only one of eight key targets have been met. A workforce crisis that has been brewing for years is getting worse. These problems didn't appear overnight. It is the legacy of a decade of the SNP controlling our NHS. The First Minister was the Health Secretary for the best part of those 10 years. Does she accept full responsibility for the problems it now faces? First Minister. Um, yes, I accept, as First Minister, full responsibility for what happens in the health service. I also accept responsibility for the fact that the health service budget is £3 billion higher than it was when we took office. I accept responsibility for the fact that there are 11,000 more staff working in our health service than there were when we took office. And I accept responsibility uh, for the fact that whether we look at inpatient waiting times or outpatient waiting times, these are lower today than they were when this government yeah, yeah. took office. So I accept responsibility for all of that and more. I also re accept responsibility uh, for the manifesto commitment we made in the recent election where we said that we would, over this parliament, build on the increases we had already made, yep. increase the health budget by £500 million more than inflation. I think Kezia Dugdale has got a cheek to stand here and talk about funding in our health service when she authored a manifesto that promised the lowest funding increase to the health service of any party can Testing the election. Perhaps you should put our own house in order. President Officer, the First Minister can read out every statistic she likes from that big book of excuses. But there is, there is a human cost. There is a human cost to a decade of SNP mismanagement. Just ask the patients. And there's one patient that isn't satisfied, is James Nielsen from Fault House. Mr. Nielsen was a miner. He worked down the pit his whole life. He has a blocked artery in his leg. He wanted to be in the gallery today, but when I spoke to him this morning, he was in too much pain to leave the house. Mr. Nielsen has been told he will have to wait seven months for an appointment. That's not seven months for treatment. That's a seven month wait for an appointment. We have heard the First Minister rhyme off a lot of statistics already today. But can she explain to Mr Nielsen why he has to wait seven months to see a consultant under her government? First Minister. Well, would I absolutely agree with Kezia Dugdale is that behind all of the statistics that all of the site in the health service lie human beings. Uh, I am very happy uh, to ask the health secretary to look into the case of Mr Nielsen. I'm not going to comment on that uh, today without having all of the details. It wouldn't be reasonable for me to do so. But, you know, I will repeat the point I made earlier on. Uh, as long as one patient in our health service is waiting too long, that's one too many. And I will be the first to say that and the first to say that we've got more work to do. Uh, but I look back to when we took office and repeat again that at that time, 70% of outpatients were being seen within the target 12 weeks. Today, that is 85%. That is not good enough, but it does mean we're performing well. The health service is performing well and better than it was when we took office. So I uh, you know, say again, uh, I think we have uh, a great deal to be proud of in the way our health service uh, operates and the services it delivers. That's why there is record patient satisfaction in our health service. But of course, there is much work still to do. And that's why this government is focused on doing it. Kezia Dugdale. President officer, Mr Nielsen doesn't want to know what was happening 10 years ago. He wants to know when he's going to see a doctor. <laughs> And the First Minister might not want to listen to me on the NHS, she might want to disregard Mr Nielsen's case, but she can't ignore what NHS staff are saying. One in four GP surgeries are short of staff. Nine out of ten nurses say their workload is getting worse. This summer, the First Minister set up a listening exercise, but she's not listening to patients, she's not listening to doctors, and she's not listening to nurses. The First Minister should stop living in denial. When will she wake up to the NHS crisis that started on her watch? First Minister. I think the problem, the problem sometimes for, 
for opposition leaders is they forget there are people sitting at home watching our exchanges right now. And, and they will know they will know that I did not disregard the case of Mr Nielsen. I said I would be very happy to look into that case and if Kezia Dugdale wants to pass me his details, I will do so. But they will also know the facts that underpin all of this. I am not standing here saying everything is perfect in our health service, nor am I saying that there is not more work to be done. But I am pointing to the progress that has been made, progress we are now determined to build on. And Kezia Dugdale talks about nurses. Our nurses do a fantastic job in the health service. They work incredibly hard. They work under very difficult circumstances. But there are 2,000 more nurses in our health service now than there were when this government took office. So there are more staff, there is a higher budget, waiting times are lower, so progress has been made. But yes, much work still it has to be done. That's why this is the government that is not just investing in our health service, but determined to undertake the reforms in our health service as well, to make sure it's fit, not just for today, but for the future as well. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Tuesday. Patrick Thank you. The, um, the Scottish Government is due some credit for its work on climate justice, aiming, in their own words, to secure global justice for the many victims of climate change who are usually forgotten. They say that this does not exclude people in our own communities. It's not simply an international issue. It seems, though, that this principle doesn't apply to people living under the flight paths at Heathrow. A third runway would cause a quarter of a million extra flights a year, a massive increase to emissions, the single biggest threat to the whole UK meeting its climate change targets. It would leave thousands of people's homes too noisy and too polluted to live in, and unknown tens of thousands more left suffering the damaging health effects. Presiding officer, I can only imagine the outrage, and I would join it, from the Scottish Government and from their colleagues at Westminster, if the UK Government to, was to inflict this kind of damage on so many lives in Glasgow, or in Inverness, or in Dundee, in exchange for alleged economic self-interest, yet they will now trip through the voting lobbies to bail out a Tory Prime Minister who stood for election saying no ifs, no buts, no third runway. What is the point of a principle like climate justice when it is surrendered so easily? First Minister. Well, firstly, I'll let the Prime Minister uh, explain her own position. Uh, but, you know, this, the, the decision on another runway in London, whether that's at Heathrow or anywhere else, is of course a decision for the UK government, not for the Scottish government. But in welcoming uh, the announcement that was made this week, uh, we recognise there are many hurdles still to be overcome in terms of the decision around Heathrow. In reaching the judgment of the Scottish government on this, this work was led, uh, of course, by Keith Brown, our Economy Secretary, we look very carefully at the option that delivers the greatest benefits to Scotland, not just in terms of our economy, but also in terms of connectivity. When you look at connectivity, 40% of long-haul visitors to Scotland connect through Heathrow compared to just 4% who do so through Gatwick. Now, obviously, we're working hard with our airports to increase direct flights, but that hub connectivity remains very important to Scotland. On the economy, there's a potential for significant uh, construction spend in Scotland and thousands of jobs. In the nearer term, there is potential for a supply chain hub at Presswick, extremely important in terms of economic impact and jobs. Uh, a £10 million route development fund, a reduction starting in January in passenger uh, charges that will make services between Scotland and Heathrow much more uh, viable in a new marketing campaign as well. So these are the reasons on which our decision uh, was based. Now, Patrick Harvey rightly uh, raises the issues of uh, climate change and emissions, and the, the UK government will have to answer questions and satisfy people on their answers to these questions. But in terms of the Scottish government, uh, we have... Uh, taken uh, global leadership, shown glo global leadership by actually including uh, both domestic and international aviation in our emissions reduction targets. So where policies, either policies of the Scottish Government or policies that we support would increase emissions uh, in aviation, uh, then we have to work harder to reduce emissions in other areas in order uh, to meet our overall targets. So climate change, uh, meeting our emissions reduction target is something this Government's got a strong record on and will continue to make sure that we show leadership on. Patrick Harvey. You see, the, the arguments about 
connections to more destinations would make sense if that was going to be instead of more short-haul aviation. But the Scottish Government's own approach shows that they want more of both. And as for the job creation figures, these are entirely spurious. We begin with the Airports Commission, 59,000 by 2030, then 75,000 by 2050. Heathrow's own pie-in-the-sky estimate of 180,000. This is about as believable as the job projection figures for Donald Trump's golf course. We're not surely going to fall for this, are we? What were the Heathrow bosses putting in the drinks at SNP conference? <laughs> and as for fares, as for fares, both with the Heathrow deal and with the, the Scottish Government's policy on cutting APD, they seek to reduce fares on aviation, despite the fact that aviation already enjoys its privileged position as the only transport mode that pays no tax on its fuel. Public transport remains overpriced, unreliable and run for private profit. Rail fares from Glasgow or Edinburgh are often three times the price as flying to London. Surely, the First Minister must accept that it's time to focus on the affordable, sustainable, low-carbon transport that people actually need in their daily lives, instead of boosting the most environmentally destructive, most unhealthy and most unsustainable transport mode. First Minister. Firstly, I, I totally respect Patrick Harvey's position on this, but I, I would say to him that when you come to take decisions and the Heathrow decision is not the Scottish Government's decision. We've made a judgment about which option best uh, suits Scotland's economic and connection connectivity interests. But when you come to taking these decisions, it's not always either or between all of the things that the Patrick Harvey talks about. We have to strike the right balance. Of course, uh, public transport, good quality, affordable, accessible public transport in Scotland uh, and connecting Scotland to other parts of the UK and indeed other parts of uh, Europe is extremely important. But so too is making sure that we have the air links uh, that allow our economy uh, to grow and uh, to, to boost the connectivity that our economy often depends on. So these are decisions that we have to balance. Uh, obviously, around all of that is our obligation, our moral obligation, uh, to meet our climate change targets and to reduce emissions. And I would simply say there that the Scottish Government's record, while I'm not complacent about it, is a very strong and a very good record. Unlike many other governments, we include emissions from aviation. We've met our target years ahead of schedule and of course we're already working on increasing that target and making sure we've got the policies in place to meet that. So these will uh, always be difficult decisions to strike and difficult balances to strike but meeting our climate change targets uh, but also ensuring we have the infrastructure to enable our economy to grow and support jobs. Uh, these are not mutually exclusive objectives. Uh, these are things that governments have to do in the round. Question number four, Willie Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Will you ready? Uh, the Audit Scotland report on our NHS is a horror show. The Government said it would eradicate bed blocking by now, but thousands of people are still stuck in hospital. It said it would meet all the targets, but miss seven out of eight. It said it would recruit enough GPs, but the shortage has got worse. The Royal College of Nursing is right to ask how many more reports will be published by Audit Scotland before action is taken. Does the condition of the NHS give the First Minister sleepless nights? First Minister. Uh, the NHS is always uppermost in my mind day and night because it is one of the most important responsibilities of any government to make sure that we have a health service uh, delivering for patients who need it. As I've already said in response to earlier questions, we have a health service that is performing well in difficult circumstances. There have been significant improvements over the time this government's been in office, but the health service faces significant challenges in common with health services across the world. Uh, Willie Rennie uh, mentioned delayed discharge in particular, the number of bed days lost uh, to uh, delays has actually reduced in the last year. So progress, but much more work uh, to be done. Uh, similarly, on uh, primary care, uh, we've recently uh, made clear our commitment to shift resources from acute care into primary care uh, so that for the first time, by the end of this parliament, for the first time ever, half of the total health budget will be spent not in acute hospitals, but in the community. I think that is uh, a really important commitment and one that is right. So uh, we've got work to do I will be the first to admit that but compared to health services in many other parts of uh, the UK and all other parts of the UK our health service is performing well and it's facing up to these challenges and this government's job is to support it to do so I'd say just one 
last thing uh, to Willie Rennie. I mentioned earlier on uh, that our health budget has increased by £3 billion uh, since we took office. Uh, in many of these years, of course, that was against a backdrop of a Conservative Liberal coalition at Westminster that was reducing Scotland's overall budget by 5% in real terms. So maybe Willie Rennie should reflect a bit on that uh, before he stands up and talks about funding for the health service. Willie Rennie. The First Minister is blaming everyone else for the last 10 years. It's about time she accepted responsibility yeah, yeah, yeah. for her own responsibilities. <laughs> Workforce planning is the way to get valued staff with the right skills in the right place. But the Auditor General is very critical of this government's workforce planning. The Royal College of GPs say we will now be over 800 GPs short. The Health Service has only five yearly workforce plans, but it takes seven years to train a doctor. So isn't it the tragedy that it takes nine years to educate an SNP government to take this seriously? First Minister. Uh, of course. That completely ignores the fact that there are more doctors working in our health service today than there were nine years ago. There are more staff overall working in our health service than there were nine years ago when we took office. And we'll continue to make sure that our health service is adequately resourced. In terms of the planning, as I've said in previous questions, uh, we are working uh, to implement our new national clinical strategy. Uh, that, together with the integration of health and social care, our work in population health, is how we will deliver our 2020 vision and work is underway, as I think I said earlier, on bringing all of these strands together into an integrated delivery framework, uh, which will also inform our workforce plan and our investment decisions to make sure uh, that these uh, strategies can be implemented. So, you know, I'm, uh, I know I'm now repeating myself, but it's worth saying again, our health service is making progress. Uh, it is performing well, but in common with other health services, it faces real challenges. That's why this government is promising, uh, and it has already delivered record investment, uh, a, a record number of staff. Waiting times are lower than when we took office, uh, but we take nothing for granted. We continue to work hard with the health service to make sure that we can build on that progress. Number of supplementaries. First of all, Kenneth Gibson. <laughs> Thank you, presiding officer. The First Minister will be aware that Associated British Ports is attempting to entice the lifeline Arran Ferry Service from Ardrossan to Troon with a loss of at least 165 Ardrossan jobs, despite the fact that the existing service is the most direct, shortest, fastest and cheapest route for passengers, cars, buses and hauliers. Can she confirm that Ardrossan Harbour remains the Scottish Government's first choice Ayrshire port in serving Arran? And when can we expect a decision to ensure that the new £47 million ferry currently being built in Port Glasgow to serve Arran will sail from Ardrossan Harbour? First Minister. We are committed to providing the best possible service for Arran, including works at Brodick Harbour as well as the new ferry that Kenny Gibson refers to. Uh, a task force has been set up, led by the Transport uh, Minister, to look at Ardrossan in the first instance, although of course uh, no options are off the table. Any consideration will take into account the local social and economic benefits and the impact on public spending, but principally the needs of ferry users. Uh, I can assure Kenny Gibson that no decisions have been made and will continue to engage closely with all stakeholders in analysing the options. Jackie Bailey. On radio this morning, the Health Minister stated that the opposition was standing in the way of service change. The irony of that statement is not lost on this chamber. So assuming the First Minister is taking responsibility for service closures, will she therefore name the health services that she believes should close? Is it the children's ward at the RAH? Does that mean she's already decided to close the Vale of Leaven maternity unit? And, presiding officer, does that mean that the promises made to my community by the First Minister and the Health Secretary before the election count for absolutely nothing after the election? First Minister. Well, all, all of the particular services that Jackie Bailey uh, refers to there are, are currently undergoing due process. That is the right and proper way to proceed, uh, and that due process will continue. Uh, I say again, I will take uh, no lessons from Labour when it comes to protecting local health services. Uh, we've talked a lot today about the situation in the health service when this government took office. When this government took office, Monklands and Air accident emergency services were on the brink of closure and they were saved. 
by this government. But you know, generally speaking, there is a moment of truth coming for the opposition because they are all quite happy to talk the language of shifting the balance of care from acute health services into the community. We will soon see whether they're prepared to back that rhetoric with action when it comes to supporting the implementation of our clinical strategy. I suspect we all have a suspicion about how they'll behave in those circumstances. Gillian Martin. SNP pressure at Westminster has prompted the UK government to review their two-child limit and rape clause for benefit payments. Will the First Minister join with me in urging people to respond to the consultation and leave the Tories in no doubt that their pernicious policy should be scrapped? First Minister. Well, the rape clause policy is uh, disgusting, immoral. It should never, ever have seen the light of day in the first place. Can I take the opportunity to pay tribute to Alison Thewlis, uh, who represents a part of my constituency in the House of Commons. Uh, she has been steadfast uh, in her determination uh, to uh, fight this clause. Uh, the announcement this week of a consultation is welcome, uh, but I think it's too early to declare victory. I would encourage people to respond to that consultation and I would call on the UK government uh, without any further delay to drop a policy uh, that forces women in certain circumstances, if they want to access tax credits, to prove that they have been raped. I cannot think of anything more disgraceful than that. Neil Findlay. Um, over the last 30 years, the Blackburn Local Employment Scheme in West Lothian has helped over 3,000 young people, including many have been, who have been in care, into employment. The future of the scheme is extremely uncertain due to the inflexible way in which SDS grants are managed. I have twice written to the Cabinet Secretary seeking a meeting to try and find a solution, and both times my request has been refused. Developing the young for workforce is supposed to be a priority for the Government. Will the First Minister now instruct the Cabinet Secretary to meet with me and representatives from BLESS so we can find a way forward for this essential service. First Minister. Uh, I'm happy to ask the Cabinet Secretary to meet with the member. I'm, I'm not familiar with this particular service in, in detail, but I know services like this do a fantastic job in local communities. So the member's raising uh, a reasonable point uh, and the Cabinet Secretary will arrange to meet with them and discuss it in more detail. Question number five, Joan McAlpine. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the First Minister provide an update on discussions with the UK Government on protecting Scotland's position in the EU? First Minister. Well, as uh, mentioned in Mike Russell's statement to Parliament yesterday, he and I attended the Joint Ministerial Committee at Downing Street on Monday. Uh, Mike Russell also met with David Davis and David Mundell last week. Uh, on Monday, we again set out our determination to protect Scotland's place in the single market. Uh, despite a full and frank exchange of views around the table, we learned uh, nothing about the UK Government's approach to the EU negotiations uh, than we already knew when we went into the meeting, which was, to put it mildly, frustrating. However, we do now have an agreement that a detailed work programme will be developed uh, for the GMC subcommittee, which will be integrated into the wider process so that devolved administrations can influence key cabinet subcommittee decisions. Uh, the Scottish Government will continue uh, to focus on protecting Scotland's interests, the economic and social interests that have been put uh, at risk by the Brexit decision. Jim McAlpine. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Expert research shows that Brexit threatens up to 80,000 jobs in Scotland and could cost the economy over £11 billion a year by 2030. Uh, we now know, thanks to the Goldman Sachs tapes, that Theresa May privately agrees with forecasts like this. Publicly, she says Brexit means Brexit. Privately, Brexit means disaster. In discussion on Monday, did the Prime Minister offer an explanation to the First Minister as to why she's now happy to be led by the wishes of hard-right Brexiteers over economic, uh, economics and common sense. First Minister. Uh, no, she didn't, uh, but I suspect the truth is that the Prime Minister doesn't have uh, a plan for Brexit, and so the hard-right Brexiteers are able to impose their own agenda. Uh, when we met this week, uh, the Prime Minister was unwilling or, I suspect, unable to answer even the most simple and obvious questions. Uh, Brexit might mean Brexit, but the Prime Minister couldn't tell us exactly what that platitude means in practice. The only new information we got on Monday was that the UK government has set up what they have called a hotline to David Davis. 
Uh, I can share with the Chamber today that Michael Russell's office called that hotline this week. He called it just before midday on Tuesday. It took until after 6pm yesterday to actually get David Davis on the hotline. That's <laughs> 36 hours. So yes, there is now a telephone line we can call. It's just currently not very hot. <laughs> Adam Tompkins. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, uh, to, when is the first minister going to... When is the First Minister going to understand that securing the best possible Brexit deal for Scotland requires ministerial collaboration and cooperation with the UK Government, not, not hostility and threats? Ye Ye yesterday, in his statement to Parliament, Mike Russell was unable to identify even a single positive contribution that the Scottish Government has made to the JMC Brexit process. All we heard was moaning about the United Kingdom. Can the First Minister do any better today? First Minister. Well, of course, what uh, the Scottish Tories want the Scottish Government to do is, I suppose, what they have done, not collaborate, but capitulate. And that's not what we are prepared to do. But I do think collaboration is essential. I just wish the UK government would start collaborating with us. You know, 36 hours to get through in a hotline doesn't strike me as very constructive collaboration. I've been very clear uh, about uh, my priorities. Firstly, I want to work right across the UK and across the political spectrum to avert a hard Brexit for all of the UK, because I think it will be a disaster. Uh, if that's not possible, we will put forward proposals to avoid a hard Brexit for Scotland, to keep us in the single market, even if the rest of the UK chooses to leave. And when we put forward these proposals, it'll be interesting to see uh, what the response of the Conservatives will be, because of course, uh, in the referendum campaign, uh, Ruth Davidson was uh, very clear, and she has been clear uh, in the days after the referendum that she thought Scotland should stay within the single market, that the UK should stay within the single market. So the proof of the pudding around this will be to see whether the Scottish Conservatives are prepared to back proposals that are in Scottish interest or if they're going to continue to capitulate to their bosses at Westminster. Question number six, Maurice Corey. <laughs> Thank you, President Officer. Um, to ask the First Minister, further to the decision by the Scottish Secondary Teachers Association uh, to take industrial action, what steps does the Scottish Government endeavour to take to resolve the issue of teacher workloads? First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government's Education Delivery Plan, published in June, made clear our commitment to tackle bureaucracy and address excessive teacher workload. We've worked with teachers, parents and other partners in education, both nationally and locally, to take concrete steps to address workload issues. These include the recent announcement of the removal of unit assessments in the national qualifications. The removal of these units is part of a package of measures designed to address unnecessary bureaucracy and liberate teachers to focus on what they do best, teaching young people. Maurice Curry. I thank the First Minister for that answer. On these benches, we share the view that strike action is not appropriate, but nonetheless, there remains a serious issue with teacher workloads. The Scottish Government's own figures show that between 2008 and 2015, there was an 11% decrease in the number of secondary school teachers in Scotland, representing a loss of some 3,008 staff. In particular, since 2007, more than 100 STEM teachers a year have been cut, with 187 fewer computing teachers, 410 fewer mathematics teachers, and 105 fewer chemistry teachers. This is clearly having a strong impact on teacher workloads in key subjects. And in light of these statistics, what action is the Scottish Government taking to stem and reverse this trend? First well, as the member will be aware, in the last uh, couple of years, the Scottish Government has provided funding to local authorities to maintain teacher numbers, and we encourage uh, them to continue to do so, uh, to make sure we've got the right numbers of teachers in our schools uh, to teach young people. But the issue of workload is an important one. It's why uh, John Swinney, since he has been a appointed Education Secretary has spent so much uh, time and effort uh, working with teachers to try to address the legitimate concerns that they have and the changes to the National Five Higher and Advanced Higher Qualifications uh, announced by the Deputy First Minister are part of a package of measures designed to address unnecessary bureaucracy um, and take away workload from teachers uh, that was felt not to be necessary and not to contribute to their job of uh, teaching young people. Uh, when you look uh, as a whole at the plans we have in place, uh, making sure funding is getting to areas 
of greatest need, uh, bringing new transparency to school performance, our uh, governance review, making sure that power and responsibility lies uh, where it should, as close to or in schools uh, as far as possible with uh, head teachers. Uh, this is all about a determination to ensure that teachers are able to do what they do best uh, and that the contribution of teachers in teaching uh, is helping us raise the standards in education and close that attainment gap. It is something we are absolutely focused on and will continue to be so. Question number seven, Fulton McGregor. Thank you. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government will seek to improve systems supporting children in care. First Minister. Uh, on the 15th of October, I announced an independent root and branch review of the care system. Uh, the review, which will be the first of its kind anywhere in the world, will be taken forward in partnership with young people who have experience of care. And it will look at the legislation, the practice and the ethos and culture of the system. It's of vital importance that we listen to young people's experience of being looked after. And I am absolutely committed to using what they tell us to help change the care system, put love at the heart of the care system and make their lives better. Fulton McGregor. I'm delighted by the First Minister's commitment to a review. What other action is the Scottish Government taking to support care experienced young people to have the best opportunities in life? First Minister. Well, we have already taken specific action to modernise our children's hearing system, uh, to review secure care, uh, establish our Youth Justice Improvement Board, support kinship carers, review learning and development opportunities for foster carers and residential workers and support families on the edge of care. These are just some of the things we have already done and the list uh, could go on. Uh, and there are improvements being made. Uh, school inclusions, for example, are down. More young people are in permanent rather than in temporary placements. But when we look at the statistics for young people who experience care, uh, none of us can be satisfied uh, that we are yet doing enough. Those statistics are absolutely horrifying. Um, and when I speak to, as I have been doing a lot recently, young people who are in care or who have been in care, the, the, the simple message they give me is the system uh, works well to stop things happening to them. And, and it should to some extent. You have to have safeguards in place, but what it doesn't do is always operate to make things happen for them. We need a system uh, that ensures that where young people can't live with their own families for whatever reason, where the state becomes their corporate parent, then we give them a sense of family, a sense of belonging, a sense of love, and that the whole system is operating to make sure they can reach their full potential. That's what I'm determined to do. Uh, but government can't do it alone. This parliament can't do it alone. We'll only succeed if this is driven by the experiences of young people in care. And that's what's going to make this review unique. Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much, President Officer. Can I welcome very much what the First Minister had to say there, but could I urge her to look at, in particular at an area where those with care experience are glaringly underrepresented, and that's in terms of access uh, to higher education. Will she look specifically at the support available to those with care experience uh, to ensure that the, the maximum opportunities provided uh, for them uh, to gain the benefit of a university education? First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I will give that commitment. Indeed, we've already announced uh, certain changes to help make sure that that uh, commitment can be delivered. I, I mentioned the statistics earlier on. One of the horrifying statistics is that only 6% of care experienced young people will go to university. Uh, that's why we have already accepted the recommendations that came from our widening access commission uh, to ensure a guaranteed place at university for a care experienced young person that's got the grades, uh, but also to ensure full grants for care experienced young people going to university. So that's uh, one concrete example of progress that we are already making. Uh, but we've got to do much more and we've got to do it in partnership with those who are the experts here, those who are in care or who have experienced care. I've been moved beyond belief by some of the conversations I've been having with care experienced young people in the last uh, few months. Um, and I've got no doubt that if we come together, not just as a parliament, but as a country, and if we put these young people at the heart of what we're trying to do, then we can do something really special, something that in years to come, we can all look back on with pride. Question number eight, Miles Briggs. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the statement from the RCN that nursing in Scotland is facing a perfect storm. First Minister. Well, we appreciate the dedication of our nurses and midwives and indeed all of our NHS staff and recognise the pressures they face. 
Under this government, there are now more than uh, 2,100 extra qualified nurses and midwives, which is a, a rise of more than 5% since we took office. Uh, we're, of course, not complacent. That's why this year we will again increase the number of trainee nurses and midwives, uh, a fourth successive rise. Uh, we'll also uh, spend £450,000 to enable former nurses and midwives to retrain and return to the profession. Uh, the member used the, the phrase, which I accept uh, was the RCNs, about a perfect storm. Uh, what will add uh, to the challenges that our health service is facing, of course, is a situation uh, where those who work in our health service from other countries uh, are prevented from doing so in the future. So when we value our health service staff, make sure we value all of them, regardless of where they were born. Miles Briggs. Well, with, the, with, the, uh, with the First Minister today taking responsibility for the health service, does she believe that it was a mistake as health secretary to cut the number of student work placements in Scotland? And can she tell Parliament, why has it taken 10 years for her government to bring forward an NHS workforce plan? First Minister. Workforce plans are in place in health boards and, as I've just said, the number of qualified nurses and midwives working in our health service today is higher than it was when we took office. Uh, that, I would suggest, uh, means that the policies of this government have been the right policies, but we've got more work to do and that's why, as I've been saying earlier on, we're determined to do that work, to focus on the challenges and work with our NHS staff to make sure we can meet them. Thank you. That concludes the First Minister's questions. We now move to oh, the point of order on that hour. This morning, Labour requested an emergency question on the publication by Audit Scotland of the worst report since devolution on the state of the NHS, with only one out of eight standards met. On refusing, the reason, as I understand it, was that Thursday provided an opportunity through First Minister's questions. <laughs> Presiding officer, emergency questions are the opportunity for Parliament to hold the relevant minister to account. The standing orders are clear that emergency questions can be asked on any sitting day, including a Thursday. It cannot be right that the Cabinet Secretary for Health hides behind the First Minister or is she simply out of her depth. This report is a damning indictment of the Health Secretary and she should be coming to Parliament Sorry, can I ask to address one second, this Mr. chamber. Sauer. One second, Mr. Sauer. Please, could I ask members, please, to just let Mr. Sarwar speak? Mr. Sarwar. I think the tone from the SNP benches tells you how much they respect the NHS and its hardworking <laughs> workforce. So, therefore, presenting officer, can you let us know if you have been advised by the health secretary had any indication? Sorry, Mr. Sarwar. So, sorry, I can't. I cannot hear the point of order. Would members please let him speak, Mr. Sarwar? Isn't it amazing we hear everybody's voice, apart from Shona Robinson's voice on this issue? So when can we have a statement from the Health Secretary to this Parliament about how she has let our NHS decline like this? Thank you very much, Mr. Sauer. The, the, the member makes a point. It is not a point of order. The member is perfectly capable, the member is perfectly capable of speaking to his business manager and raising it through the business manager at the Bureau on Tuesday morning. That concludes First Minister's questions. We move on to members' business. I would ask members to be quiet in moving their seats, please.